Josh, we are in the final episode of the final doctrine of our final series. We made it. We made it. <laughs> no more theology after this, people. Never. <laughs> never. We will never talk about. If you want about... theology, nope. go to another podcast. No more no, debates. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, we're in our third episode on eschatology, the study of last things in our Doctrine 101, Theology 101 series. And um, man, this has been a fun it's been a fun journey. Yeah. I realized when I was scrolling through how I think we began this back in October. So it's just been October, November, December. I mean, we are now in our fifth month. And I know we've had come some breaks. We've talked about some other things, but this has been this has gone way longer than I thought. Hmm. But I think it's been good hmm. because I think a lot of people need to know why they believe yeah. what they what the what to believe and why they believe what they believe. And so yeah. This whole series has to, has really been motivated from from that, and so uh, I'm Ben. I'm the lead pastor here at Life Fellowship Church. I'm here with Josh, our producer of Life Talks, and um, our final episode of this series is going to be dealing with the final state, as it ought to, as it ought to, <laughs> heaven. And hell is what most people refer to as the final state, but heaven and hell is not really the final state. Did you know that? What? <laughs> what? Most people- No, I don't most, know that. Most, you, you know those tracks you see where it's like, you know, choose heaven or hell and mm. like heaven's got clouds on it and mm. hell's got fire. Yeah. Well, the Bible really doesn't use those terms as the final state. Huh. Okay. Um. Now, I understand where they get those terms from. Typically, we get the term hell from the word Hades or Gehenna in the Greek, mm -hmm. which is a place of burning and torment and fire. It's the Sheol in the in the um, Old Testament, mm -hmm. which is the holding place of the dead. Um, and in heaven, we talk about the heavens in um, a place where, where God dwells. Uh, Paul talks about being taken up into the third heaven, right? Mm -hmm. in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, but really, if you go to the end of the book, book of Re Revelation, the apocalypse, in chapters 21 and 22, you really have this idea of a new heaven and new earth, and you also have this lake of fire. So the idea of the final states being heaven and hell is not, not I think the ideas of both those places is, is legitimate, even, but I think new heaven and new earth and lake of fire is, is the biblical terminology used. Now, the reason why they call hell is thrown into the lake of fire. We see this in, in uh, the book of Revelation. Hell is thrown into the lake hell of fire? Hell is thrown into the lake of fire. Yes. Yeah. So Hell is a place in my mind. Yeah. So I'm having a hard time yeah, wrapping so I, my mind I think it, the imagery is, is, okay, so you have, G last week we talked all about Jesus's return mm -hmm. and his millennial reign. Yep. After the millennial reign, you have the judgments. Mm -hmm. There are going to be three judgments that the Bible talks about. Mm. Um, you have the great white throne of judgment. You have the judgment seat of Christ. And then you have some judgment of angels. Don't ask me what that is, but we know that angels will be judged. Okay. Wow. Okay. All right. So let's deal with these judgments in order. Yeah. First one we see is the the final judgment of non-believers. This is what we call the great white throne of judgment. It's in Revelation chapter 20. And um, this is when after the, after the reign of Jesus and he resurrects all humanity and the resurrection of all unbelievers will face Jesus in this great white throne. And it says the books were opened. And if your name was written in the Lamb's book of life, you don't have to show up to the great, great white throne of judgment. Hmm. But if you show up to the great white throne of judgment, you will sit there and you will they will open up the books. They will open up the books. And every act, every sin, every thought, everything that you have done that is against God and his law will be read before him and you will receive judgment. Hmm. That is a... Horrifying. You don't want to be there. No, you do not want to be there. It's a long trial. It's gonna, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, when you think about billions of people going over. No, just my own. My own list is a really long, you know what I mean? Like, that's a long, it's, that's a long I day. mean, it, we're talking about probably tens of billions of people and trillions, tens of trillions of acts. Wow. Done. And God will pronounce them all. 
word by word, line by line. It is a it is a frightening place to think about. Um, we see this again, Revelation chapter 20, Matthew chapter 11, verse 22, Luke chapter 12, this idea that God will judge the non-believers. There's going to be a time when God pronounces his execution of justice on people that have rebelled and sinned against him. Okay. So when the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, this is the idea, not just there's a separation, but there is going to be an eternal death that, that this, this is what Revelation calls the second death, that there's not only an, an initial separation from God spiritually, physically from him, but there's going to be an eternal separation. Okay. So that is the, that is a really bad place to be. You don't want to be there. Yeah. And there's only one way to escape that. And that is having your name written in the Lamb's book of life. If you are, if your name's written down there, you get to go to an award ceremony. Okay. Like the end of a new hope. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, sort of. <laughs> Something like that. All right. So it's called the Bema Seat. And Bema Seat is, um, uh, it was a place of judgment that people gave. Um, it's where they would, where they would pronounce judgments on legal issues or uh, cultural issues or even um, the, the awards ceremony of games, right? Mm -hmm. There's all these, okay. the Bema seat was used in, in that in that way. So when when you think of, Great White Throne of Judgment is really going to be really bad. When you think of judgment seat of Christ, what do you think of, Josh? I didn't know these were different things, Ben. I'm already, <laughs> you're already blowing my mind. And I also didn't know that Christians skip the first thing. So I'm so confused right well, now. Well, I mean, I think most people, most people are, I think most Christians believe that when they, I think that you agree. Most people probably assume that both are the same thing. No, that we get, Paul talks about the judgment seat of Christ in um, Romans chapter 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 10, and 1 Corinthians 10, verses 10 through 15. He calls it the day, all right, in that passage, but specifically the judgment seat of Christ. Here's what we know about the judgment seat of Christ. It is not going to be... A, this is what I was always afraid of growing up. Like one day yeah. you're going to be judged by what you do. And so I literally, I, I just had this picture that I'm going to show up in heaven one day mm -hmm. and all the Christians are going to be in this giant massive auditorium. It's yep. like, yep. now calling Ben yep. Rudolph, yep. come forward. And I'm like, oh no. And like your family is going to be like right there in like the front and so, row. And so God's like, all right, all right, everyone, everyone quiet down, quiet down. All right. Turn the lights down. Let's watch Ben's Turn life. On the biggest, the, highest definition you screen, screen you've ever seen. And he's like, he's all of a sudden you see this this episode play out, and he just right. says, all right, pause, pause. Right, right. What were you thinking in that? Right. <laughs> I think about this every day. <laughs> it that's terrifying. Yes, that's not going to happen. That's oh, not God. going to happen. Now, how do I know that? Because Paul says in Romans eight. Chapter eight, verse one, there is therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Yeah, this, this is always confusing to me. <laughs> you're never you're going right. to be, that doesn't make you're sense. not going to be judged on your sin. The judgment seat of Christ, when it talks about that, Paul talks about you'll be judged by what you do for God. Hmm. You'll be judged in your righteous deeds. Oh, yeah. Because what he says is in, in, for, in the first Corinthians passage that you will, um, in first Corinthians three is this idea of, all of your good works will be placed in front of God and they will it will either be wood, hay, or stubble, or it will be, you know, gold refined by fire. So the whole idea is all of your righteous good deeds will be put and it will be purged and say, what was really done for me, for God? Mm. The things that were done for your own name, your own glory, your own pride, your own whatever, it's gonna be burned up because you really didn't live that righteous, those righteous things out for the glory of Jesus. Hmm. The only things that will remain are things that are done for the glory of Jesus. And so it's going, to, yes, there there will be some, I think there will be a level of sadness maybe, mm -hmm. maybe because what we're going to see, I think for a lot of people mm -hmm. is there's going to be certain things that, I mean, you might see somebody like this, you see this giant mound of, of things. You're like, whoa, that guy did a lot. And all of a sudden it's going to be like, boom, gone. <sighs> gone and all of that. Your, your ministry, your missionary for 50 years did all these things. Yeah. But you know what? You did it for yourself. Like mm. there's a, that's the judgment. That's sobering. That's the judgment seat of Christ. It's not going to be this idea of we're going to, we're going to criticize you of every bad thing you've done. 
Yeah. We're, but we are going to judge the righteous things you've done that are going to be done, that were they done for the glory of God or the glory of yourself? So knowing, let me tell you how significant it is me hearing that. Like this, like my mind is blown, but mm. that instantly makes me feel a little bit less anxious, conflicted or weird. No, specifically like thinking about my relationship with mm. God. So I'm, and we've talked about this to, you know, before, but I'm kind of one of those people that grew up with the, yeah. you know, my, I feel like God's on this throne way out past <laughs> Pluto somewhere <laughs> and judging me, looking down yeah. on me. I, I have a hard time getting in touch yeah. with the father part if I'm yeah. Not playing a piano, you know, like <laughs> I can get in touch there, but in my real life, it, yeah. it, I have a hard time. And so I think part of that is I take my sin and, and, and everything so seriously. And that idea, like it's never made sense to me, the spiritual or theological idea that like our sins are like literally wiped pure as snow. Like this whole thing, like that doesn't make sense to me because right. I, I, I know so much. And so what you're saying lines up makes way more sense with that concept yes. of like I really did deal with this in the past. Yes. So therefore, why would we be dealing with it? My mind is so blown right now. <laughs> well, because think about it. He just Jesus. God says in His Word, He will He will remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. Right. We, we'll never. We will never face God in heaven, and He's going to bring up all these sins you did ever. Wow. Ever. It's done. It's paid for. It's covered. The only thing that we will face God for is the things that we did, the righteous deeds we did, whether they're for us or him. And if they're done for us, it's going to be burned up and we're going to have very little left over to lay at the feet of Jesus. Yeah. But if they were done for his glory, then we get to offer God this immense amount, this sacrifice of of rewards to say, no, this is God. This is because of you. So, so okay, can I ask about that then? Okay. Yeah. So, so, so the thing that we are going to deal with. Yeah. The heart is deceitful and wicked. Yep. I don't know how often I've ever done anything for purely one motivation. Yeah. Like there's always some of, or at least a lot of times yeah. there's some yeah. of both. I mean, even Paul says, I can't remember where he says it, but he says, I don't even judge myself. He says, hmm. I can't judge myself because I don't even, I, I'm going to let God do that. Right. Because I might, I might in my own mind think I have the purest motivation, but right. I don't. Yeah. And I think we can we can fool ourselves, we can deceive ourselves. I think we can ask God to really purge that our that pride and arrogance from our lives, but man, it is it is a work of the spirit to actually do something to say this is 100% pure for God. Because even in those moments where I feel like this is really for God, I have this little tiny voice in the back of my head and it's all like, "Oh, and like right. don't no, I don't want to go there. I'm going to yeah. like get behind me Satan." Yeah. I think that Man, I just think that it should set us free. Yeah. It should have set us free to be like, no, I never have to. When I see Jesus face to face, it's going to be nothing but pure joy. There's not going to be shame. There's going to be zero shame when I meet, meet Jesus. That to me is one of the greatest, that'll be one of the greatest moments in the history of all of our existences, when we get face to face with Jesus and we realize the love that we experience, the joy we see in his face, the delight he sees that we see in his face for us personally, that there will be, that there's no shame, but pure love. Like, I, I just think we've never experienced love like that before, yeah. ever. And I, I think he's giving it to us now. It's just hard for us to kind of, we still have to wrestle through all of the, the messiness of our lives. Yeah to to get there but so so you have the great white great white throne of judgment judging non-believers judgment seat of christ or the bema seat that's a that is a reward ceremony or judgment of believers and again there's a verse there in the bible that says things done whether good or bad or evil basically it means worthless things that are worthless hmm. it doesn't necessarily again that's not ta- he's not talking about sin he's just talking about things that you were done that were done for a worthless and or evil purpose okay okay um, and then lastly, we have angels being judged. We know angels are going to be judged because Paul talks about that we are going to judge them. How that works out, First Wait, Corinthians. We? Yes. Us? We? Believers. Oh, Again. This is even weirder this, than This is, we read that in first, I believe it's First Corinthians chapter six, um, that we're going to, verse three, that we're going to judge angels. We know that Peter says in second Peter chapter two, that angels, there's, there's a holding place for some demons 
uh, or, or angelic beings that will be judged later on. But there's going to be a judgment time for Satan and his angels. And all, and, and yeah. we're going to be a part of that. I, how that looks, I don't know. Don't ask me. Witnesses, maybe? Maybe just witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. I don't know. But we're going to judge them. So you have these three judgments. And after, the, after these judgments, um, we will enter into the final state. That God will send the devil, his angels, and all people who have rejected him as Lord and Savior into the lake of fire. Now, there's a lot of people that are like, oh, I just can't imagine God doing that to people for eternity. It just feels mean. It feels it feels like, oh, like why would you torture people forever? And again, one of the things that um, we have to remember is that I I don't I don't necessarily agree 100% with this statement. C.S. Lewis talks about heaven or hell being locked from the inside. Mm-hmm. I think there is a I think there's a thread of truth in there, but I don't think it's like all true. God obviously sends them there. But what I do believe is that, and I think we shared talked about this before, mm-hmm. anytime God mentions someone in hell, which is Luke chapter 16, the guy doesn't want to go to Abraham's bosom. He wants to stay where he's at, which is weird. He's in hell. When God, when when Jesus is telling the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, and the rich man goes into Hades, and Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom, he's in paradise. Right. They can see each other. There's a right. chasm, right. and the rich man's like, "Hey, can you send Lazarus over here to dip my tongue in water so I can be relieved from this pain I'm in?" Right. What is so odd about that request is that he doesn't ask to go over there. I think I've been as, always assumed that he knows that he, that's like out of the yeah, but but realm but, of but, but what is he asking for? He's asking for relief, but he's not asking to. Go, he's not saying, "Oh, I wish I was over there." Hmm. That's so odd to me. He, like, why wouldn't you say, Father Abraham, please give me another chance to, to get over there? He doesn't say that. He just says, I want my comfort level over here to be better. That's odd. Hmm. So, and I think you have to wrestle with that idea that it's, I don't believe that people are going to be in hell, like banging on the door, like, let us out. Let us, I, I genuinely believe people are going to be, this is what I chose. And they're going, as much as it's going to be torment, I think there's going, they're going to suffer torment. It, it's going to be a sense of, but I, 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 I don't want that. I, I, at some level, I think that there's just this weird thing that when you see someone in hell that says, I don't want out of here. I, I don't, I don't get that, but it, that's the mindset of that person. Hmm. So obviously I believe that God is just, God is just to punish people for their sins. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and again, this is some, I know a lot of modern Westerners have a real problem with an eternal torment, mm-hmm. Right big problem with that. Mm-hmm. But I do believe that we got, we can't let our culture get in the way of this. I remember hearing from a Indian, Indian pastor one time who said in the Eastern world, we do not have a problem with hell. Hell makes complete sense to us. And it, we actually appreciate hell. What we don't, what we, most Indians, most, most Eastern cultures have a problem with um, unmerited favor, get people getting into heaven. We, the idea of karma is so instilled in their mindset. Mm-hmm. The idea of grace confronts that and is like, wait a second. Right. The way that hell offends some people here in our Western mindset is the way that some people in the Eastern context, heaven offends them. And you have to like, that's where I think we have to like take a step back and be like, it's, we can't be cultural snobs and be like, well, we, our, our culture is superior to, the, to their culture. There's a real issue there that they have with you're telling me that you could have done all these horrible things and all you got to do is pray this certain prayer, believe this in this God. And all of a sudden you don't have to pay for the penalty of your sins. And, and they would literally say, that's not a good God. What do you do with that? So you, this is a, this is a, these are cultural values that yeah. people have yeah. that people wrestle with. And so again, when someone's saying, Oh no, no, we have no problem with hell. We totally get hell. We believe in hell. It's heaven we have a problem with because people should put, should pay for their sins. It's all, that's the whole point of karma. Like you come back as you're a really bad human being, you come back as a snail. Right. Like they, that makes total sense to them. And so we have to remember that there's, we always can allow our cultural biases to influence our theology in, in ways. And so just take a step back and say, 
I got to make sure that I'm conforming myself to the, to the, to the standard of God's word. But I only have a couple minutes left. And let me just talk about um, the new heavens and new earth. Most of us think that we're going when heaven, when we're in heaven, we're going to be sitting on clouds in white robes, strumming on harps forever. I don't believe that's going to, it, he says new heavens, new earth. We will literally be our, our future. Our eternal future is a physical earthly future. Hmm. We are not going to be these ethereal beings. All the best parts of this world that we get to enjoy now will be multiplied by a thousand. Hmm. We will get the, the most beautiful mountains, the most beautiful oceans, the most beautiful um, waterfalls. Well, I mean, yeah, the, yeah. The, the nature, creation, um, competition, like all of these things that we find great joy and fulfillment in in this life. Music. Music will be to the to the exponential beyond understanding pleasure and enjoyment in the future. Mm. That to me is good news. Yeah. Because I think a lot of times people are like, oh man, I'm I really love this part of this world. I, I kind of hope heaven is excited. Like, no, that's the whole point. The whole point is the best parts of this world are a mere shadow of what is to come in this world because it's a new heaven and a new earth. And to me, that should give everyone just an incredible amount of joy mm. and hope to believe that. They've got a rich future ahead that God un, God put certain physical pleasures in our life here on this earth to enjoy, to prepare us for eternity. Mm. And I love that. Mm. I love that idea. So anyways, um, final state is, is, a, is an expression of God's justice and God's love. And that to me is what we have to keep in mind when we think about both new heaven and new earth and the lake of fire. All right, we did it in 20 minutes. Josh, anything else? I mean, I have a lot of <laughs> conflicting feelings about hell, but I don't think we've got time to get into that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we won't open up. Maybe we'll open up the can of worms another another time. Sure. Worth worthwhile doing. Yeah. All right. Um, guys, that is theology 101. You got a chance to hear about all these major doctrines. Yeah. And I hope this is go back, listen to them. If you if you've ever come across a, a, a theological question you're not sure about, man, email us, life talks at lifecharlotte.com. We'd love to hear from you. We do this show to encourage you, to, to build you up, to make sure that you um, have the answers for life, uh, that you're growing closer to God's to God and, and through his word, through his spirit. So again, um, thank you again for joining us on this journey. And we'll talk to you next time. <laughs>